Welcome to Retriever Talks 2021. We are delighted to have you join us and are excited about today's event, which features the stories, research, and lived experiences of eight of UMBC's best and brightest faculty and staff. Stories that link us to our collective values and identity as a community of excellence in higher education. Our first talk by Dr. Jeff Cullen, It's Time We Got Off the Sidelines, urges all of us to join the movement to challenge white supremacy and dismantle systemic racism. Our democracy is hanging by a thread. If you believe, as I do, that our 234-year-old experiment as a democratic republic is worth salvaging, then it's time for us to take bold action. Throughout US history, there's a continuous thread, a bloodstained thread that we don't talk enough about. And that continuous bloodstained thread is white supremacy. It begins with the founding of our country. As you may know, in the US Constitution, enslaved Africans are counted as three-fifths of a person for the purpose of determining apportionment in the House of Representatives. What you may not know is that the US Constitution also contains a baked-in provision, ensuring that the importation of enslaved Africans would continue unabated for at least 20 years, giving this abominable approach an economic foothold in our new nation. Of the 55 signers of the US Constitution, about half owned slaves. White supremacy is a continuous threat. Following the Civil War, ex-Confederate soldiers and other Southerners formed vigilante bands to terrorize and harm blacks and their allies. The Ku Klux Klan saw a resurgence in the 1920s, sometimes garnering enough support that they controlled entire state governments. KKK violence and intimidation continue even in the present day. White supremacy and mob violence are a continuous thread. In 1898, a mob of whites <clears throat> overthrew the multiracial coalition that had been elected to office in Wilmington, North Carolina. They destroyed the only black newspaper in the city. They killed hundreds <clears throat> and destroyed property and businesses belonging to black citizens. Soon thereafter, other local jurisdictions began passing laws to disenfranchise black voters, which is continuing to this very day in states all across the US. White supremacy and mob violence are a continuous thread. Politicians have been stoking white racial grievances for decades, going back to Richard Nixon's Southern strategy. Refined in various political campaigns, for example, the Willie Horton ad that George H.W. Bush ran against Michael Dukakis, white grievance politics reached what I hope is an apex this past January 6th, when a mob of whites attacked the US Capitol building, seeking to invalidate the votes cast by urban blacks as somehow fraudulent. White supremacy and mob violence are a continuous thread. At key points throughout US history, white men have taken violent action and exercised mob rule to ensure that white supremacy was maintained. White men, it's time for us to level up in combating white supremacy. We need to get off the sidelines and confront white supremacy squarely. And even though I'm saying level up, and I'm using a sports metaphor like get off the sidelines, let me be clear, this is not some sort of a game. But white men, if we're not part of the solution, then we're part of the problem. Now obviously, I'm a white man, so how do I see this? Well, I wasn't born harboring racist thoughts. However, like you, I was socialized by the media, by a flawed and incomplete version of history taught in schools. I, like you, was influenced by parents and peers, reproducing the socialization that they received without questioning or deconstructing it. As a white man, I don't have incentives to dismantle structural racism when it benefits me. However, if racism is learned, then it can be unlearned and it should be unlearned. Clearly, systemic racism benefits whites at the same time that it oppresses people of color, but there are negative impacts to systemic racism for whites that are often overlooked. For example, we're separated one from another with our fellow citizens of the world. As the world becomes more interdependent, it's clear that my well-being as a white man is intimately and intrinsically linked with the well-being of my brothers and sisters that are people of color. We need look no further than the transmission of a global pandemic virus to know that this much is true. 
Although there are not visible role models, nor a clear roadmap for doing this work, it's imperative that we get started on the journey. One starting point I recommend is the book Me and White Supremacy, written by Leila Saad. This book is written as a 28-day challenge to read and reflect. I started at the beginning of this month. To dismantle white supremacy, we need to begin by decolonizing our own minds. We need to talk about how we, as white men, have benefited from white supremacy. We need to be honest about the times that we've been complicit or silent. We need to interrogate our own implicit biases. And we all have these implicit biases. We need to be in conversation with one another as white men. We need to be co-conspirators for social change and to work for real and not just to, for the optics. We ought to be about forging intersectional coalitions and honestly assess what it is that holds us back. White men, it's time for us to level up. We need to close this sordid chapter in our national history once and for all. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. In our next talk, Jill Randalls explores how we can deepen our interpersonal relationships by using listening as a pathway to presence. It was one of those hot, steamy, Maryland summer mornings, and I pulled into the barn to ride my horse. And as I walked into the stable, I was struck by how different it felt. But as usual, I was on a mission, and I sort of ignored it. Because when you normally walk into a barn, this is what you see. You see horses interacting with each other. You see them looking towards you, interacting with the people in the barn, even if it is just because they're hopeful that you have a treat. It's not necessarily that they're so happy to see you. But there was none of this. The barn was quiet, except for the whirring of the fans that were blowing hot air to try to cool the horses. They all were standing in the back of their stalls. And again, I noticed this. Right? This was not really normal. But again, I had my goal, I had my plan for the morning, jumped into it, grabbed my grooming box, grabbed my, my tack, went into my horse's stall, and started getting her ready to ride. Now, of course, I talked to her through the process, and I gave her pats. And again, I noticed I barely got a flick of an ear, which again, I noticed, but ignored it. So as I lifted the saddle pad and the saddle to put on her, in a split second, she had reached around and grabbed the top of my thigh. Now, it hurt. And I thought for sure I was going to look down and see a major injury that I was going to have to deal with. Fortunately, that was not the case. I went ahead with my ride. As usual, right, we have to stick with our plan. And to this day, I have a small dent in the top of my thigh that is a reminder of that day. Now, you might think, why is she sharing this story? What, possible, what possibly came out of this for her? Well, a lot of it came out. What really happened? A lot of things. So first of all, I walked into a context. So when we are together with each other, when we are in community and in relationships, the context matters. I was listening, but not really. I heard myself, I heard my instincts, I heard the tone of the horses, I ignored it all. Every last bit of it, still on my mission. There was communication happening. Doesn't necessarily have to happen in words. And I paid very little attention to those, and on top of that, I ignored the relationships that I was entering. Horses live in community. I was entering into that community with very little awareness of them, in one way at least. Here I was, they were communicating with me, but I really wasn't honoring it. I really wasn't present. So this story, I'm gonna carry it a step further, and I want you to make this journey with me. I want you to think about a friend or a community or an experience that you've had that you might have wanted to manage differently. I want you to invite that person to stand or sit with you. I want you to see yourself back in that community if it was a community setting. And I want you to take a breath for a moment and invite them on this journey with us. 
in much the same way I have invited my friend that I'm going to tell you about to stand here with me. I was a sophomore in high school. My father was stationed in Hawaii, and we were due to be there for an extended period of time, which, of course, as the military works, it was not an extended period of time. So sooner than I anticipated, I found myself standing in the parking lot saying goodbye to my best friend. She has, was near and dear to me through my time in Hawaii, and um, I learned a great deal from her. She was a biracial child in the 70s, which is different in some ways. She was someone who cherished her culture, her relationship with her culture. And as I was leaving, she handed me something. She handed me this figurine that I held in my hand. And she said, Jill, as you leave, I want you to take a piece of me with you. So my comment to her as a sophomore in high school was, thank you, this is a wonderful gift, I'll cherish it. But I missed the point. Here I was being communicated with, and I responded to the best of my ability, but I really didn't have the skills, I really didn't have the knowledge, and I really didn't have the experience to acknowledge what she was asking me to acknowledge, which was to see in her values that she cherished. Many years later, as you can see from this presentation, I have carried her story with me. And what I learn and continue to learn in relationships with horses and with people is that I need to pay attention to a few things. My stories have asked me to, and compelled me to really think about some areas. And I mentioned a few of them. Context, reality, experience, assumptions, teaching, and engagement. Creating a way in which we are together. And this requires action on my part. I have an active role in this, right? I have to analyze the situation. I have to reflect on it. I have to give myself space to do that, give other people space to do that. I have to own what I know. And I have to question what I think I know. Where does, what I, where does my understanding come from? Who taught me that? Is it still part of me? Is it still something I can embrace? What do I need to confirm as I am in those relationships and in those opportunities with people and, and in the work that we all do together? And I have to analyze and own my part in it, right? So this person or this community that you invited to sit with you, would it look different? if you thought about that relationship in this way. Mine certainly would look different. Because I believe that listening and reflective listening is about action. It is about figuring out what comes next. It is about expanding our understanding. My friend has contributed to my life in this way all of these years. I have been challenged ethically, morally, spiritually, my behaviors, my beliefs have all been impacted by this one gift that was given to me. She was really my first teacher in thinking about different voices, different experiences, how we bring that together as we come together. It is my hope that what we see coming out of this kind of context is what is possible, not what's wrong. Now think about that for a second. Do you, do I, as we embrace each other and are in community, do we think and approach that by what is possible or what is wrong or what needs to be fixed? That feels very different to me. Does it feel different to you? Possibility. What do we need to fix? What was wrong? I just think it's a very different way to embrace and to acknowledge our own feelings and our instincts as we bring that into community. My whole body feels different when I think about things in that, in that type of context. It is my feeling about this 
that makes this so important. The reflective listening, the way we hear each other, and that has to be extended to ourselves as well as to others. Do we do this in a way that provides grace and forgiveness? I've forgiven myself for not being as prepared as I should have been to hear her story. But I am also compelled to be different. So as Margaret Wheatley asks us to consider, let's not forget that if we are fearful, it's hard to be fearful if we know someone's story, if we carry their life, their heart, their experiences in our hands, if we build bridges that connect us to them, to what we can learn from them. We have to trust that conversation is going to matter. We have to trust that by listening, by being truly present, which I was not in all of these stories I shared with you, being truly present, we can create possibility. Next up is Ray Selner, who looks at how habits, not just our thoughts, act as critical linchpins to our success or failure. We all have habits. Normally, when we think of bad habits, we think of things like this. Smoking, overeating, constantly checking our phones. But what about habits as it relates to mindset and our thinking? What if I told you that complacency can be a habit? That hiding from what scares us can also be habitual? Usually, we look at these as behaviors. But if we aren't careful, they can turn into habits. In some professions, though, habits carry a much greater weight. In Adam Grant's book, Think Again, he parallels the behaviors that we experience in day-to-day -day life with the tools of wildland fighter fighters. Specifically, he focuses on four wildfires where 23 firefighters tragically lost their lives. But what these 23 brave souls have in common is that they were all running for their lives, were within eyesight of a safe zone, and had carried all their tools and equipment with them. With their lives at stake, why would they choose to carry upwards of 75 pounds of equipment all that way? There are a lot of variables that come into play when making decisions like these. But what we do know is that these tools, while in the hands of a firefighter, become much more than just a tool. It's through years of intense training and experience that these tools become part of their uniform, but also part of their identity. They value and cherish these tools because they've been used to save their lives and the lives of others countless times. In fact, some surviving firefighters recalled spending valuable time trying to save place to hide their tools, and in that moment, valued the survival of their tools over themselves. But here's another thought. Is it also possible that they carried all that equipment out of habit? That they were so used to the weight and the feeling of that equipment on their body that they literally never thought to drop it? Whether it was their identity or their habit, this powerfully represents the importance of challenging our own thinking and watching the habits that we form. We may not have life and death decisions like those of firefighters. But if we aren't careful, we can get locked into behaviors that develop into habits and ultimately influence our thinking and our identity. It's embarrassing for me to admit that in the first few years of my career, I became increasingly uncomfortable in social settings. It's no surprise that I'm an introvert. I was thrilled when the majority of my job could be done from my office and where my interactions with the campus went something like this. Email first, phone second, face to face, <laughs> only when necessary. I didn't consider myself a people person, but this might have been a little extreme. I was comfortable, maybe too comfortable, and the ha habit formed of avoiding interactions that made me uncomfortable. 
But as that habit set in, I wasn't just becoming uncomfortable around others. I was also starting to believe that this is who I was and that I wasn't capable of anything else. This is where our thoughts, our habits change our thoughts. I had become so practiced at working safely behind the scenes that it when it became time for me to do something that was a stretch, the experience of it alone would reinforce that this is something I was not good at, something I wasn't capable of, and something that I couldn't be. But not all habits are bad. In fact, if we do it right, habits can be a powerful tool for success. We've heard Freeman's quote a hundred times. Watch your thoughts. They become your words, actions, habits, character, destiny. This is the right way to create a habit, with attention and intention. But before we talk about creating habits, it's important to understand what a habit is. A habit is a mode of behavior that has become nearly or completely involuntary. Neuroscientists believe that habits are formed in the basal ganglia. This is an area deep in the brain near where the spinal cord connects. But we know it's our prefrontal cortex that's the area of the brain used for thought and decision making. So when we create a habit, we're actually moving the action and behavior from our prefrontal cortex to the basal ganglia. And this gives us a few advantages. The first is that formed habits make the action and behavior easier to perform going forward. Think of something that used to be hard for you, like parallel parking. At first, you might have found this challenging. It took a lot of thought, concentration. The more you did it, the easier it became. Eventually, you almost didn't have to think about it anymore. Another big advantage of habits is that it frees our brains up for other simultaneous thoughts and decisions. This is why we can have a conversation and listen to music while driving at the same time. When we build healthy habits intentionally, they can be powerful tools that we can use to be successful each and every day. This is one of the reasons why personal trainers focus on establishing an exercise routine. They know that if you can turn that routine into something that's habitual, something that you do every day, you'll be much more likely to succeed and stick with it. On the other hand, though, bad habits can form accidentally. Sometimes we don't even realize it. And they're very tough to break. One of the interesting things that I found about bad habits is that even the strong ones, even the ones that are part of how you see yourself, can cause us to be unhappy. This might resonate with many of you. How many of you go for that late night dessert and feel bad about it immediately afterwards because you've had a big bowl of ice cream every night this week? But in my career, I found the more I shied away from others, the more dissatisfied I became with my job. I felt trapped with nowhere to go, and I was disconnected from the community that I served. I watched as colleagues and role models foster relationships across the campus, present seemingly with ease. I was letting old habits define me, become increasingly unhappy, and jealous of others. It was a cycle of misery. But I didn't understand that. There wasn't anyone that could help me make sense of it. I just knew that I was unhappy. So how did I break it? I got lucky. I think ambition won out. Even though I didn't see myself as a social butterfly, I also couldn't stand feeling limited that way. So I started taking baby risks things that were just outside my comfort zone, then increasingly larger risks. I wasn't always successful. I usually felt awkward, 
sometimes like an idiot, but I always was okay, and I always learned something. Over time, though, my habit of avoiding was replaced by one of attacking. At times, this felt like a form of self-abuse, but I viewed anything that made me uncomfortable as a challenge, and I went straight at it. So tell me, think of your own life. What habits are weighing you down? Now the fire is at your back, and you have a choice. Are you going to move forward the same way that you have? Or are you going to cut the weight and do something different? Leaving what we know behind is scary, but it also gives us our biggest opportunity to grow. I know what I'm going to do. So tell me, what are you going to do with your one precious life? Watch your habits. They just might become your thoughts. Thank you. Following Ray is Dr. Diane Alonzo, who, in spite of the disasters of 2020, chose to reframe it as a year of opportunity, both personally and professionally. So I think this image really speaks to my feelings about 2020. Anyone else feeling this? How about this? So what does it mean to survive 2020? Well, in recognition of all those who did not survive and for the many who suffered greatly, it goes without saying that this past year was horrific. But I would like to suggest that in the devastation of this past year, we have been granted an opportunity. While 2020 forced us to deal with uncertainty and relinquish control, it has also given us the chance to reinvent ourselves to find our personal strengths and take them forward into the future. I'm talking about abilities that we already have within ourselves that we often don't recognize until such a time as we need them. Today, I would like to share with you some of the strengths that I discovered this past year. Now, some of you may have been there and done that, but for others, perhaps, this will be an opportunity for you to think about your personal strengths. Like many of you, I entered 2020 with great hopes. It was a brand new year, a new decade, and time for a fresh start. But I was also entering the year with many of my old habits and mindsets. I didn't yet realize how the year would truly shake things up, that I'd have to rethink and revisit many of my old notions and ideals. As a UMBC teacher, advisor, and program director, I'm used to being overly prepared. But in March 2020, that all got trashed. I had to scramble to redo all of my courses. I threw together video recordings, online activities. I had to attend training sessions, learning new tools and technologies. I had to create a sense of community. This was outside of my comfort zone, and I felt totally overwhelmed and stressed out. It was like the sky was falling down on me but I didn't have time to panic. I had to get on board and forge ahead. Of course, this didn't always go as planned. I really hated talking to a screen full of gray silhouettes. And not surprisingly, many of my hastily thrown together activities failed miserably. It was devastating and soul crushing, especially because teaching was something I truly loved. But because of this, Having gone through this crazy pivot, I saw that failing wasn't actually catastrophic. In fact, in the long run, many of the things that I ended up with were actually better than what I originally planned. I came up with new and different ways of teaching. I spent time creating that sense of community, and I also was able to give myself a bit more grace. I learned to recognize the benefits of flexibility and how to let go of some of that control I had been grasping so tightly. Now, while I never want to go through that kind of upheaval again, I am grateful for the opportunity to see that this newfound flexibility 
could not only keep me afloat, but actually raise me up. Now, in addition to coming up with new ways to teach, I also need to find new ways to connect with my students outside of classes. Now, I'm a problem solver. I consider that one of my defining characteristics, and it served me well in my job. For the past 17 years, I have been in a position to hear from many students, some I know well and some I've never met before. And I've used these skills to help them solve their problems. However, when 2020 happened, I was inundated with desperate emails from my students, and I realized I just had to stop and listen. A young woman who was fleeing a domestic violence situation with three small children, another whose grandparent had just died from COVID and who was taking care of a sick father, a homeless student who was logging in from their car in the parking lot, and so many others who didn't have the money to pay for books, let alone tuition for the semester. I felt hopeless. I didn't know how to solve their problems. There was no easy fix. I struggled over every email, trying to find just the right words, and even then, not knowing if what I said was helpful. I'm sure that many of my messages completely missed the mark, and others went out into the void. But once in a while, I would get a reply, just thanking me for responding, for paying attention, for listening. I finally understood that what I was dealing with was an inherently unfixable problem. What I wanted was to solve their problems, but what they needed was to be heard, to be recognized, and for their situations to be taken seriously. Listening gave me the opportunity to see beyond those gray silhouettes. I am grateful for the opportunity to see and hear more clearly not only what I can do to impact my students, but how each one of them have impacted me. Now, this past year has taught me to welcome uncertainty, embrace change, and listen more fully. I'm learning to accept that I do not have, nor do I need to have, ultimate control, and that failure is not defeat, but rather an opportunity. This way, we can take our greatest challenges and move forward with renewed skills and strength. Now, I have to admit that all of this is still a work in progress and part of my ongoing story. I haven't yet mastered all of these skills, and I don't always remember to use them. I know, though, that they are there for me, and I'm grateful for having found them among the rubble of the past year. Saying that 2020 was a tough year is an obvious understatement. But it is in the past, and it is now time to move forward. And so, like a phoenix reborn, we too have the opportunity to emerge from this last year, gather our strength, and reinvent ourselves as we rise from the ashes of 2020. Thank you. In our next talk, Mentees to Mentors, Eric Ford shares his story about the power of community and family values in shaping and transforming young people to carry forth their family's legacy. My grandmother, Daisy Manson, was born in 1894. Imagine what life would have been like for a black woman in the early 20th century. Imagine what she would have wanted for her grandchildren to achieve. There's a saying that says, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And I would like to share with you, through mentoring and resiliency and perseverance, how I became just that. I would argue that your grandmother or your strong maternal figure in your life is your first mentor. Like a mentor, your grandmother is your confidant, your advisor, your advocate, and most importantly, your educator. The values given to me by my grandmother were like seeds that were planted, and if nurtured, would allow me to unlock my personal truth and allow me to reach my destiny. I am of the belief 
that the universe intentionally places mentors in your life based on key values that are needed for you to reach your self-actualization. These values are responses based on past experiences, joy, trauma, and are passed on through generations of your family. Similar to epigenetics, these values become a part of your family DNA. It is up to us to unlock them through the mentors we meet throughout our lifetime. The first value I was reconnected to was unity, and this was through my experience with being a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout. My troop leader stressed the importance of staying together, looking out for one another, and multiple people united as one. This is my family here. We get together at Thanksgiving, my extended family. And unity, or umoja, as we say in Kwanzaa, is by far the fundamental principle my family lives by. This has resonated with me throughout my entire life, and it's one that I stress with my own children. Were you in the Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts or, or Brownies? And if so, what value did you learn from that experience? Commitment was bestowed upon me by my youth basketball coaches. There is nothing that teaches commitment like sports. You are expected to attend practices, games, and at all times remain focused on teaching and reaching the goals established by the team. This is me here at my rec basketball league. That's me holding the basketball in the middle. I can remember the first time one of my players referred to me as coach. It struck me immediately because I realized that I am not just a coach, but I am a conduit of my grandmother's virtue of commitment. Were you involved in youth sports? If so, what did your coach, what did you learn from your coach? And how did that coach have an impact on you? JROTC and my high school instructor taught me self-discipline. Modeled after military principles, the class and program taught me about delayed gratification, and that there are consequences for your actions, sometimes that impact not just you, but others on your team. This is my JLTC instructor here, Colonel Hawkins, a man that had a tremendous impact on my development and growth. Several of my uncles and my brothers served in the military, which is indicative of the importance of military in my family. This jacket that I'm wearing was owned by my brother, and it's a tribute to him when he was in the Army. I chose to creatively add to this jacket to reflect the other ways in which I've chosen to carry on the virtue of discipline in my family. So who was your favorite teacher? And what value did you learn from them? Service and servant leadership is an important value that a senior manager modeled for me at a previous job. It was important for her to reach back and support black men and help them reach their full potential. Author Rachel Naomi Remen tells us that helping is transactional and one directional, while service is transformational and reciprocal. Let that sink in for a minute. Service is healing, and the benefits are mutual. In true mentoring-mentee relationships, both parties equally learn from each other. The concept of reciprocity and mentoring is what we teach our AmeriCorps members and service learning students in the Shriver Center. This allows my grandmother's value of service to reach thousands of people throughout Maryland and beyond. This is me here mentoring a young man in Northwest Baltimore. In my early in my career, when I first showed this picture to my staff, they laughed at me and said, Eric, is that young man even paying attention to what you're talking about? <laughs> I would like to think so. So what supervisor or coworker left an impression on you, and what value have you learned from them? And here's where my career becomes full circle. My first job out of Hampton University as a mentor 
for young people in West Baltimore was with the Choice Program out of the Shriver Center at UMBC. I returned to UMBC in 2011. Dr. Rabowski and Lamar Davis taught me about purposefulness. They helped me to understand that the position I reached was not by accident. It was my life's purpose. All of my experiences led me to this moment, which is to lead the choice program from the perspective of a black man who has overcome significant obstacles to lead the program and give back to that program that gave me so much. When in a mentoring relationship, guiding someone towards their life purpose is so important. For once you understand your purpose or calling, you are able to set goals and work towards them with intentionality. So have you supported someone in helping them find their purpose? These values are my guideposts that I refer to daily when leading my organization. This is the way that I am paying my grandmother's values forward through my department, with community partners, young people in my program, all of these things. Without them, I would have fallen victim to low self-esteem, lack of confidence, and the imposter syndrome. It brings me so much joy to give my grandmother Daisy Manson eternal life through both being a mentor and being a mentee. These mentors were placed in your life for a reason, to reconnect you to your family values. So my challenge to you is to identify the values from your mentors in the past and use them to mentor others. Be mindful. In our next talk, It's All in Your Mind, Leveraging Fear as Fuel, Dr. Antonio Silas shares his inspiring story of how he used fear to catapult him to new heights. We may not know each other very well, but the common thread binding us is that of shared life experience. For example, at different times and different contexts in all of our lives, we feel fear. Today, I wanna to offer my own story told in three chapters about how I turned fear from an adversary to an ally. Chapter one. Saturday, February 9th, 2008 is a day I'll never forget. It's the day my father passed away. I was 20 years old and a junior at Tennessee State University. When my family member delivered the news, it hit me like a truck, barreling down the road at full speed. It was jarring. He was there, and then he wasn't. It felt like I had lost my foundation, and the ground was shifting beneath me. For the first time in my life up to that point, one of my greatest fears had become a reality. There was already a lot of transition going on in my life. This just added more to an already full plate. My newfound reality and my fears weighed heavily on my heart and my mind. Chapter two. Losing my father was hard, but I ultimately grew from the experience. I started thinking differently about life. Recognizing the role that health played in my father's life made me much more conscious of my own mortality. I decided to get in shape, lost 50 pounds. I was a senior getting ready to go to graduate school. Life was okay, it was manageable. I'd suffered a huge blow, but I felt like I overcame it. In retrospect, I wasn't really intentional about addressing the newfound fears that my father's passing left me with. I just kept moving to the next thing. After graduation, I went to school at a large university to pursue my master's degree. Being an HBCU graduate at my academic institution, I'm accustomed to a certain level of community. I didn't feel this in my new home. Being the only black man in my department, I felt like I experienced 
a variety of scenarios that was not the norm for others. I did not feel welcome. It was difficult. It made me question my own abilities. Despite my best efforts and two years of hard work, I ended up getting kicked out of that program. Once again, for the first time in my life, I'd experienced another first. I had no idea where my professional path was leading. It felt like everything was burning down around me and there was no salvation in sight. From this point, I hit a real low. I wasn't leaving my room for hours at a time. I was so stressed, I developed a physical tick. And all that weight I lost in the last chapter, that came back, and more. I went from the peak of overcoming adversity deep down into a dark valley full of uncertainty. Chapter three, I ultimately credit my mother with giving me the motivation I needed to go back to school. She said that I should not let fear dictate my moves in my life. And when I really thought about it, that's exactly what I've been letting happen. In that moment, I said aloud, no more, and I applied to a master's program. Over the course of the next year, while I was working a full-time job, I got my master's of public administration. I used this momentum to apply for my doctorate. For the first four programs I applied to, I got rejected. A colleague recommended Virginia Tech. I applied, they invited me down for an interview, and two weeks later I found out I got in. That was big news, right? Even then, in that moment of joy, I still felt fear. This time it came in the form of imposter syndrome. I was scarred from my last experience. I felt like I didn't have the perspective, the knowledge needed to move forward. But when I ultimately thought about it, I recognized that didn't make any sense. The difference this time around is that I had experience. I knew what went wrong last time, and I allowed this knowledge to quiet the fears in my mind. Sometimes we just have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you got this. I took that energy, and I graduated with my doctorate in three years. Following that, my professional, academic, and personal life came full circle, and I was able to find a career in student affairs, which allows me to pour into others. I'm incredibly thankful for that. So you may be wondering why I decided to share this story today. Ultimately, my hope is that you're able to get something from my experience. So here's what I learned about the process of going through fear. Number one, fear is natural. Know that if you're feeling fear, it's normal and you are justified. Also know that the only way to overcome your fear is to be intentional in facing it. We often fear what we don't know. When you feel fear, dig into why you feel the way you do. Examine it and understand it. Number two, you can't control what comes your way. Podcast host, philanthropist, and former heavyweight boxer Mike Tyson is the author of one of my favorite quotes. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Know that metaphorically, repeatedly, life will punch you in the face. There's no way around it, which leads me to my next point. Number three, be intentional in choosing how you will respond to fear. We can't always choose what comes our way, but we do have the ability to choose what comes next. I chose to use my father's death as motivation to get my own health in order. I chose to learn from my master's program experience going into my doctoral program. Today, I'm choosing to share my experience with you in hopes that you may gain something from it. Choose to understand your fear rather than being conquered by it. By leaning into my own experiences with fear, I was able to stop looking at it as an adversary and begin looking at it as an ally. Fear is often an indicator of true and present danger, but in some cases, it's a construct of the mind. When you feel fear, lean into why you feel the way you do and seek to understand it. Let that knowledge illuminate the dark pathways of uncertainty in your mind. Thank you. Dr. Tori Williams invites us to imagine a world where authentic conversations about mental health create a culture of acceptance and belonging. Three years ago, I was trapped by relentless suicidal thoughts. 
I existed, but I wasn't really living. Negative talk spiraled into my default mindset. My depressed brain felt unworthy of support. And my suicidal ideation felt unalarming, probably because it was my new normal. How was I supposed to practice self-care when I couldn't even remember what used to make me happy? I'm here now, though. Thanks to my journey into authentic communication and lots and lots of Ed Sheeran. I have healed and even discovered effective self-care. But here's the thing. Mental health struggles are surging, and we need to help quell that surge. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among individuals 15 to 34, fourth leading cause of death among individuals 35 to 54. In 2019, 12 million adults had serious suicidal ideation 3.5 million of them went on to make a plan, and 1.4 million made an attempt. And with this pandemic, mental health crises continue to climb. In fact, COVID-19 induced isolation and its related mental health struggles are now considered our secondary pandemic. Too often, these struggles are hidden because of stigmas and shame. So what can we do? Well, whatever the problem, community is the answer. And while I believe in this quote, we have to be critical that not just any community is the answer. In fact, I think some of our unrealistic societal expectations are how we get into these mental health messes in the first place. Stigmas burden us to heal on our own, and that just isn't cutting it, because traumatized brains struggle to see greener pastures. So the type of community I think that we need to solve this problem is one that embraces authentic communication. Imagine a world where honesty is welcomed, relationships are deep, and support is always accessible through a shared sense of belonging. Now that would be a mental health inclusive world. And maybe we can live in that world if we strive to communicate authentically. So what do I mean by authentic communication? I mean sharing the full spectrum of the human experience, reflecting on our thoughts, feelings, and actions instead of masking them. Here are my three steps to authentic communication. One, share authentically. Two, listen authentically and openly. And three, do our best to reframe vulnerabilities as what it means to be human. First, we need to take a risk and share our authentic selves. Discover how our authenticity invites others to share, connect, and even heal. Authentic communication shared by a fellow UMBC community member helped save my life. My colleague struggled privately for over 10 years and then decided to share publicly in an effort to encourage others to seek the care that they needed. And that strategy worked. His story jolted me into finally taking care of myself. And you know who else tends to share authentically with the community? This guy. Why this Ed Sheeran song made me put him in my self-care kit. This is actually a story I wrote for a health website. The song that I'm referring to here in the title is I Don't Care. I mean, that's pretty authentically blunt. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with this song, what it means to me 
is how one authentic connection with someone can be enough to pull you through adversity. Ed shares authentically through many of his song lyrics. I share my authentic reactions to his music. It's like we're basically best buds. But sharing is only half of communication. We also need to listen authentically. And here what I mean is, let's do our best to understand others' honest perspectives. For example, when I finally spoke to a therapist, it was such a relief to be listened to without judgment. I really felt her empathy. And she went on to share authentically with me about her own anxiety struggles and how she takes care of it day to day. Medication. Now, at the time, I had harbored negative bias about using psychiatric medication, but it was now my turn to listen authentically. I had tried cognitive therapy skills for months and they did nothing to stop the flood of harmful thoughts. So I went to a psychiatrist and I listened and I'm really glad that I did because not only did I stop hating myself, but I finally really appreciated myself. And I know that medication isn't helpful or accessible to everyone, though the following is actual footage of me authentically communicating to my husband post-treatment. But in all seriousness, I needed medication and that's okay. My new treatment has inspired me to communicate authentically beyond my comfort zone. It also brought me to this third step of authentic communication, which is normalizing vulnerabilities within our community. What I mean is, let's scrap the stigmas and embrace human diversity in all of its beautiful forms. Through authentic sharing and listening, we refocus on our humanity. For many of us, I might be suggesting a paradigm shift. Once I accepted that my suicidal ideation or my undiagnosed ADHD or autism wasn't shameful, then I found myself ready to love so many others around me. Now that I communicate authentically, I've developed deeper personal and professional relationships in the last couple years than compared to the 30-some years that I spent trying to fit in. I invite you to cultivate a sense of belonging through authentic communication, and here's how. You can signal your support through a symbol in your online profile or at your office. Maybe something like this. You can check in with a friend if you're worried about them. Maybe just to touch base and show support through a real conversation. Heck, you can even email me. We'll talk about all of our similar Ed Sheeran self-care strategies. I'm still waiting for Ed to respond to this open letter, by the way. Our community is impacted by mental health struggles more than we tend to realize. Struggles are often hidden behind masks of success. Suffocating stigmas can devastate on individual and collective levels if left unexplored and unchallenged. As a community, let's be inclusive, not isolating. Let's be empathetic, not sympathetic. Let's be honest, not pleasing. And let's show support instead of judgment. Let's communicate authentically and create a world where we unleash the best in people to speak up, contribute, and move our community forward. Our commitment to inclusive excellence evolves through authentic communication. And the next step 
begins with you. In our final talk, Be Like Water, Dr. Jasmine Lee reminds us of how water can be a teacher, inviting us to let go of things that are outside of our control and navigate the most difficult moments of our lives. Be like water. Be like water. Jasmine, be like water. This is a mantra that I've replayed in my mind uh, almost constantly, probably since last April. I first heard it when I was running out of breath on the treadmill. I was ready to quit, give up, sweaty, all of that stuff. Like many of us, I, I joined one of these national apps early in the pandemic because we couldn't go to pr uh, professional gyms anymore. This particular app has these coaches that say, all of these one-liners that they say to motivate you or encourage you along the way. Jess Sims, one of my favorite coaches. On this day, just when I was running out of breath, said these words, be like water. For some reason, it hooked me in. I finished running on the tread treadmill. And then when I left, I continued to think about and resonate and meditate on these words, be like water. Later, I came to find out that it was connected to Bruce Lee, who in 1973, during an interview, said these words, be like water making its way through the cracks. Do not be assertive, but adjust to the object and you shall find your way around or through it, he says. If nothing within you stays rigid, outward things will disclose themselves, empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. If you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put it in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Water can crash or it can drip. Be water, my friend, he says. This quote resonated with me so deeply, I actually got it tattooed on my wrist. <laughs> because I wanted to remind myself of it almost daily. It was that important. The thing is, I think this might surprise some of you who don't know me well, but I have huge issues with control. I'm actually the worst kind of perfectionist. I don't do well <laughs> when things are not going well, when I feel like I'm not at my best, when I feel like I'm not achieving the things that are on my to-do list, when I feel like I'm behind, when things are out of my control. So as you can imagine, the pandemic with its isolation, hypervigilance, fear, ongoing racial violence, intergenerational exhaustion and racial battle fatigue was incredibly difficult for me to manage. Everything that we faced collectively over the past year, everything that I have faced individually has quite frankly been out of my control. So I think I thought in the beginning that I would just force my way through it, that I would be rigid and strong and power through, that it would end quickly it didn't, and I couldn't. And on that very day in April, when the world was crashing around me, the walls were falling, I decided to run on the treadmill. And that's when I heard these words, be like water. Be solid like water, be still like water, be calm like water. Water is fluid. Water is reflective, it's beautiful, it's adaptable, it's life nurturing. Water is strong enough to create space, but calm enough to be absolutely still. Water transforms itself actually between liquid, solid, and gas, depending on the need, right? Water makes small ripples and big waves. Water doesn't shrink itself to fit or to be seen as acceptable. Water just flows in the direction that it was called to go. The funny thing is that even in preparation for this talk, I wrote a whole other talk, a whole different script that was absolutely connected to how you see me at UMBC as a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional. Of course, I was going to tell you about social justice and all the things that we need to do to be anti-racist or anti-homophobic or insert thing. The truth is I wasn't called to that. It didn't feel inspiring for the moment. It didn't speak to me in the ways that I wanted to speak to you. 
So, interestingly enough, as I was trying to figure out what I was going to say and grappling with how that didn't speak to me in the way that I wanted it to, the world starts falling apart again. I start feeling overwhelmed again. I'm feeling behind at work. I'm not talking to my family. And then here we go again, called back to these words. Be like water, Jasmine. Be like water. I think the greatest gift, ironically, in reflection that this horrible year has given me is the gift of letting go, of being shapeless, of being adaptable and fluid. To be like water is a lesson, it's actually a gift that I learned in COVID that will actually serve me beyond this season. And actually more than just a lesson, this mantra, this practice of being like water truly sustained me. I think it's so easy to give into life's struggles, to buckle beneath the burden of the weight that we've been carrying this year. On the other hand, I think it's really easy to lean so heavily into the positivity, to only focus on the silver linings and paint the world with rainbows and sprinkles, which we know can also be toxic. What I love about water is that when it flows, it doesn't avoid the nooks and crannies. It actually flows in darkness. And it flows to the deepest, darkest parts of the earth that we may never actually even see. I think the whole point of why I'm sharing this with you is, is not really only to share this lesson, this gift that I've learned with you, but to call you into your own reflection, your own meaning making of what has come, what you've learned. And I think almost more importantly, to think about what has sustained you. Be it your family, your friends, your loved ones. Perhaps it's the connections to ancestors or legacy that you have. Or maybe it's actually just your ability to laugh and cry, to find joy and be enraged, to be overwhelmed and still find peace, and all of those things at the exact same time in response to life. Whatever it is. Do not let this moment, this chapter, this season pass by without grabbing those gifts, those lessons, and cultivating them over time, even as we continue to navigate this global experience. I once was told a long time ago that nothing ever has to be lost, that every single thing we experience in our life, the good, the bad, the ugly, we get to use all of it to prepare us for whatever may be coming next. What will you be taking forward? What I'm taking forward is this meditation to be like water, to be beautiful, to be brave, to be adaptable, to be expansive, and always to flow like water. Thank you. Oh uh -huh.